fantastic. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second in the series of our post-COVID-19 um, BC Echo. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I am Zooming from um, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Wautooth nations. And I acknowledge that other people are joining us from other um, ancestral and traditional territories. So before we begin, a couple of housekeeping rules. This is the second in a series of 10. We are doing one of these per month. So welcome if this is your welcome, whether this is your second one or um, second time joining us or your first time joining us. Um, these programs are accredited. And we are tracking our attendance by Zoom. Please, for physicians, um, enter your first and last name along with your email address in the chat function. And um, our staff is going to, to keep, uh, keep track of that so that we can send you your certificates after this. For the Q&A session, um, please use the raise hand function. When you raise your hand, I will see that your hands are raised. <clears throat> and I'll call on you. Um, Dr. Arsenal will be um, taking questions throughout the session. So I'm going to keep an eye on that and make sure that to interrupt him at a specific time. Um, the other thing is that we have a post event survey form that will be sent out after after the session, it will be sent by email to everybody. Please make sure that you fill this out because we read your comments and we take advisement as we continue to construct this program. So this current session is a long COVID primary care toolkit and our speaker is Dr. Rick Arsenault. Dr. Arsenault is an academic general internist and a clinical professor working out at St. Paul's. BC Women's UB, and UBC. In addition to interests in medical education and medical informatics, Dr. Arsenault's clinical interests include chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and related disorders. He is the former director of program planning at the Complex Chronic Diseases Program and continues to work as a clinician in the program. He also works as an internist in the Provincial Adult Tertiary Eating Disorder Program, and he is one of the key developers for um, the BC Echo for post-COVID. Uh, take it away, Dr. Arsenault. Thanks, Anna. Okay. So first of all, there's no definitive evidence-based recommendations for long COVID. So what we're using today is a pragmatic approach and a review of published papers to see what other people have been recommending. So that means that this will be a moving target, but hopefully if you follow our handouts and our information on the website, you'll be getting the most up-to-date information. The second thing is I'm not a family doctor. And so you might say, why am I preparing a long COVID primary toolkit? Well, I kind of see this as a shared care model. I want you to think of my presentation, the tools that I'm giving you today as beta versions for you to evaluate, to test drive, and to give us feedback to say how we can better uh, contextualize them to your context. The goal of our program, uh, the, the objectives for today are to be able to describe long COVID, make a diagnosis, compare it to similar conditions, do a basic workup, identify comorbid conditions that are commonly associated, provide advice and resources for patients, and to locate physician resources. So the principles for our program is we're focusing on practical tools. We want to help manage patient expectations. We want to avoid over-investigation and especially patient-driven driven testing. The focus should be on self-management rather than diagnosis seeking. We want to leverage multiple short visits with specific tasks. And importantly, we want to uncouple visits from symptoms. So what that means is that you don't want the patient to think that they should book appointments if they're having a flare of symptoms. The symptoms, the, the appointments should be regular. The focus is on self-management. Patient has a flare, they can tell you about it next time for their regular visit. We also want to leverage existing resources. 
So let's start with a case. So this is a case of a 51 year old woman. She's married with two kids. She's a triathlete. She was previously well. She has no history of central sensitivity syndromes, which we'll talk about later. She had presumed COVID in January, 2021, but was not tested. She was bed bound for a week at the time. She, she now has persistent symptoms and is unable to return to work. These symptoms include breathlessness and difficulty taking in a deep breath associated with chest tightness. She has fatigue, decreased activity tolerance, and a key symptom called post-exertional malaise. She has widespread aches and pains, unrefreshing sleep. She now sleeps during the day. She complains of brain fog, feels mentally drained, has orthostatic intolerance, has loss, loss of motivation, interest, anhedonia, and is not coping. She feels overwhelmed. She also gets episodes of feverishness, has tender lymph nodes, and has lost her sense of smell. Important in her history is that she has no cardiac risk factors. She has no family history of coronary artery disease, and she's very physically fit. So we know that there's a lot of complications of COVID and that these encompass several systems. And you'll remember from the presentation from Dr. Jansen that we're really not sure what to call it. And so for lack of a better uh, approach, we're calling anything that is related to having had COVID post COVID. And today what we're calling long COVID are the symptoms, the nonspecific symptoms that persist. And you'll remember that Dr. Jansen told you that you've got this, that this is not something that you're unfamiliar with, that these symptoms like chest pain or shortness of breath are common symptoms that you've approached and you have a workup for these already. She's also reminded you that there is a race line for post-COVID patients. So this is a paper that was published recently that I really like, and it's from the group at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And they're looking at what we're calling post-COVID or the research is calling post-acute sequelae of SARS. Um, and we recognize that this is an umbrella term, that there's her heterogeneous groups but I like the way that they organize it because there's different ways, but they say that the patients either have tissue damage like lung scarring, myocarditis, anosmia. They may have symptoms with no identifiable tissue damage. And so this is the post viral syndrome that the Mayo Clinic lumps together with central sensitivity syndromes. And the third group is psychiatric psychological. And I really like this because the tissue damage ones are the ones that we'll work up the regular way. It's the ones with no identifiable tissue damage that come back with negative workups that are often challenging. And then you guys are all familiar with psychiatric psychological issues and deal with those every day in your primary care practices. So the messaging here is that these are not somatic or somatoform disorders. No identifiable um, tissue damage is not equal to psychiatric. Some of you may recall that uh, until MRIs were, were invented, that MS was considered a psychological condition. So often it's our, our lack of tools that are causing no identifiable tissue damage rather than there being a psychiatric problem. Because medical gaslighting, unfortunately, is a very common issue. And in this news article, they say that many long haulers never had laboratory confirmation of COVID, like our patients, that some healthcare professionals' skepticism that, that their persistent symptoms have a physiologic basis. And so, uh, you might hear the term supratentorial or non-biological. So these mystery diagnoses are real. They're not just in the patient's head. They're part of a family of post-viral syndromes. In fact, there's some similarities to ME-CFS, which is myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome. And there's now a biobank that's going to be comparing COVID long haulers with ME-CFS and healthy controls. So the group at the Mayo Clinic have proposed a, um, 
a classification for post-COVID syndrome, which we're calling long COVID. So they say it's post-viral. It happens after there's stabilization and resolution of the viral infection. It lasts for more than three weeks. That COVID testing is not required because some patients are not tested and false positives are relatively frequent. Again, this is the group of patients who have no tissue damage, and some of them may go on to meet criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, posture orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and other central sensitivity syndromes. So the interesting thing is that in this study, not to, to confound their results, they excluded patients with pre-existing central sensitivity syndromes. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. So message, long COVID is not equal to chronic fatigue syndrome, fibro, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis. We don't know the long-term natural history of these conditions. Some patients may develop these conditions, but for now, I'd really avoid labeling these patients. So the group in Rochester found that about 10% of, sorry, 9% of patients feel, fit long COVID criteria, which is exactly what we would expect. One third male, two thirds female, which is what we see with central sensitivity syndromes. The average age was 46, which is what we see with central sensitivity syndromes. And the most common symptoms that they saw were pain, fatigue, dyspnea and orthostatic intolerance. Interestingly, they did not mention post-exertional malaise. The other thing that's interesting is that the group at St. Paul's post-COVID clinic hasn't seen as much pain as this group. So they're seeing a lot more fatigue and a lot less pain. So what is the difference between chronic fatigue syndrome and long COVID? Well, there's a high degree of similarities. And studies has found that 25 of the 29 common symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome were reported by at least one study. There are four symptoms that were not reported, but they weren't asked for. So we don't really know if there's overlap. And these are motor disturbance, tinnitus, double vision, tender lymph nodes, and sensitivities to foods, medications, chemicals, odors. And this group, again, estimates that 10% of COVID patients, they go one step further and say that about 10% of them may even go on to develop chronic fatigue syndrome. But really, it's too early to establish a direct relationship between COVID and the development of ME. So this is an article that came from physiotherapists. And this is, I like the title, Humility and Acceptance, Working Within Our Limits. And so initially, it was thought that these patients were deconditioned. And so early efforts drove rehabilitation teams to apply exercise-based protocols. However, the history of ME-CFS with exercise is one of false hopes in that it often caused patients to get worse. So one of the key symptoms you have to evaluate is post-exertional malaise and worsening of symptoms. My students often mistake this to mean post-exercise. It's not exercise, it's any kind of exertion. And depending how debilitated the patient is, exertion might include trying to take a shower and brushing your teeth the same day. So the way that I ask for it is, when you do too much, what happens the next day? And you're looking for patients to say, I crash, uh, I'm down and out, it takes me a day or more to recover. You're looking for, 24 hours or more recovery. Sometimes the crash can be delayed by a day or two. The other thing, it's not just fatigue that's worse and malaise. Their other symptoms often get worse as well. So their brain fog, their sleep disturbance, their pain. So this group of physiotherapists, their main message is stop, rest, and pace. So the messaging is that Post-exertional malaise is a game changer. You'll go down a different pathway if you have post-exertional malaise, because in those patients pushing through symptoms or having what we call a boom bust pattern. So overdo it, recover, overdo it, recover, overdo it, recover. This makes things worse. It prolongs recovery and it reduces the chances of remission. This is from our um, long, history of working with chronic fatigue patients. However, if a patient does not have post-exertional malaise, they may benefit from exercise. 
can be used cautiously, and you'll watch for the development of post-exertional -exer malaise when you prescribe exercise. Dr. So, there's yep. a comment in the chat from a Vicky Russell, and she yep. is concerned that she's worried that any individual who presents with malaise or other vague symptoms could be considered could be called long COVID, especially if they've self-diagnosed without an actual positive nasal swab. For example, this initial case, could this be also perimenopause or menopause syndrome requiring a different management plan? Absolutely. And that's why we'll get into how to make a diagnosis and doing a workup. So I just want to review the a little two, two concepts around pain and chronic fatigue syndrome, because one of the key things asked by that is that those conditions do not cause post-exertional malaise. That's a pathognomonic feature of chronic fatigue syndrome. And so the idea here is that it's mitochondria, not hypochondria. And this is based on exercise testing. And you'll remember this from your physiology or from uh, working at the gym is this is oxygen consumption and this is how hard I work out. I work out a little bit, I use a bit of oxygen. I work out more, I use more oxygen until the point where I have a maximum. And this is my VO2 max. And this is the point at which I go from aerobic to anaerobic metabolism. So this is a study that compared controls with chronic fatigue. And this is day one, this is day two. There's lots of really good information in this, so I'll go through it slowly. So day one, you'll notice that the control group worked out this hard and had a VO2 max like this. The chronic fatigue group worked out this hard and had a VO2 max like this. Not a big revelation. If we had Olympic athletes, they would have activity tolerance to this, and they would have uh, VO2 max much higher. So this is just a question of how conditioned you are. The key with this group is that they repeated it at 24 hours. And on day two, and this is during the post-exertional malaise, you'll notice that there's no difference in the group that were the control, but that the group that were chronic fatigue syndrome, they were able to work out as much, but they went into anaerobic metabolism at a much lower heart rate. Their, their VO2 max dropped by more than 50%. There's no other condition that you see this with, except maybe if you develop the pul pulmonary embolus overnight or something like that. But this is the pathognomonic symptom and the feature of mitochondrial dysfunction and chronic fatigue syndrome. The second thing I wanna talk about is pain because pain is a common symptom that we see with central sensitivity syndromes. And this is a new type of pain that wasn't there when I was a medical student or a resident. We all know about nociceptive pain, which is inflammation and damage, and neuropathic pain, which is damaged or irritated nerves. There's a new type of pain called nociplastic. And noci is from the Latin for to do harm. And this is where the volume for pain is turned up. And this is a key feature for all patients with features of central sensitization. The other thing that's important is a patient may have more than one type of pain. So chronic pain is characterized by sensitization and amplifications. So let's look at the pain curve. So this is pain sensation, no pain, ouch, 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 more pain. Over here, this is how hard I'm squeezing you. And so this is going from an innocuous to a noxious stimulus. Patients with chronic pain or no seplastic pain have a left shift in their pain curve. Mm. So this means that something that should be only mildly noxious in a patient with a left shift is presents as hyperalgesia. So that's the volume knob being turned off. It might even be, whoops, it might even mean that over here you're getting pain when there's, no, when there's no noxious stimulus, and that's the allodynia. So this is the same diagram with fewer data points. And so over here, we have pain intensity, ouch, 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 ouch. And in this case, they use a clamp, so we see how much they're squeezing. The squares are patients who are controls. So I squeeze a little bit, hurts a little bit. 
But over here in a patient with fibromyalgia, I squeeze a little bit and it hurts a lot. In fact, it hurts as much as if I were squeezing over here. And so this, your patients in the past, before these studies were done, it was just said that patients with fibromyalgia are wusses, that they complain of pain, that it's psychological. We now know that their brain lights up as if they were having this much pain. So put this in context is that both chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia are part of a family of conditions that are called central sensitivity syndromes. And you'll notice I underlined the S because there's no such thing as central sensitivity syndrome. It's a family of conditions. Central sensitization is the process. Central sensitivity syndromes is the family of conditions. In fact, any kind of pain, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, has a component of central sensitization, but those are not central sensitivity syndromes. And here's a long list that you can have a look at later. But on average, the patients that I see with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia have four or five of these. We don't know yet what that, what that means. The group in Rochester didn't include pre-existing uh, central sensitivity syndrome. We're not sure if patients with these conditions are more likely to develop long COVID. So these are all things that we hope to answer in the next little while. So let's look at the artificiality of the syndromes. The fact that basically a syndrome is a group of guys and gals sitting in the room and deciding what fits in. So if we look at postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, so here you see fatigue, sleep disturbance, cognitive symptoms, GI symptoms, headaches, and other autonomic phenomena. Well, doesn't this sound a lot like post-COVID syndrome? And here are the diagnostic criteria for POTS. We're going to have a session on POTS next time, so I'll leave that. But here are the Canadian consensus criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. And you'll notice that POTS is a diagnostic criteria. And IBS is a diagnostic criteria. So how is it possible that another condition becomes diagnostic criteria for, an, for another condition? And here, urinary frequency and bladder dysfunction. Well, if that's bad enough, we call it interstitial cystitis. And new sensitivities to food, medications, and chemicals, if that's bad enough, we call it multiple chemical sensitivities or environmental sensitivities. Over here, this compares chronic fatigue syndrome with fibromyalgia. And you'll notice that the diagnostic criteria for fibromyalgia are embedded in chronic fatigue syndrome. So it's not surprising that 50 to 70% of patients have both. They have fatigue, they have sleep dysfunction, widespread pain, headaches, brain fog, and gut symptoms. Myofascial pain syndrome, muscle pain, fatigue, sleep disturbance, cognitive symptoms, unexplained dizziness, autonomic phenomena. These patients prior to 2016 would have been diagnosed as fibromyalgia, but the new criteria say that the pain has to be more widespread. So is myofascial pain syndrome simply localized fibromyalgia? All of this to say that these patients have two main mechanisms for their symptoms, amplification, turning up the dial and distortion. So things in the brains are, are not interpreted properly. So let's look at some tools for family doctors. Today's session is an overview. These are the sessions that are coming up. The next session will be on dysautonomy and POTS. I'm not gonna talk a lot about POTS today. So the principle for management, these conditions are well known to you guys. This is part of your training. Patient-centered, trauma-informed, shared decision-making, quality of life, self-management, patient education, tr transparency. What we're hoping to do is to standardize the care so that your patients are not wondering if somebody else is doing somebody something different than you are. And again, that concept of uncoupling symptoms from medical visits. So we showed you long lists of symptoms. And when you look at post-COVID studies, there's long lists of symptoms, but these are the big five. Anytime I see a patient with multiple symptoms that fit in the big five, I consider a central sensitivity syndrome. Fatigue, pain, sleep problems, brain fog, and unexplained symptoms. And those unexplained symptoms are often 
respiratory, autonomic, brain, or gut. So pain, fatigue, brain fog, sleep disturbance, unexplained symptoms. So here's a tool that we are, again, beta version for you to possibly use in your office. So over here, you have date of onset of symptoms, whether or not they had a positive test, and the symptoms are organized in the category. Pain, fatigue, sleep disturbance, brain fog, unexplained symptoms, and then psychiatric. The flip side of this sheet will have, do you have any of the following pre-existing central sensitivity syndromes? We've got the whole list here for you. So for our patient, we said that the symptoms started in January, that they were not positive for COVID. They're complaining of fatigue, mental fatigue, decreased activity tolerance, decreased exercise capacity, and the pathognomonic feature of post-exertional malaise, mitochondrial dysfunction. They're also having muscle pain all over. They're also having unrefreshing sleep, difficulty staying asleep, brain fog with poor memory, difficulty concentrating, easily overwhelmed, short of breath, difficulty taking a, a deep breath, autonomic symptoms with lightheadedness, palpitation, feverishness, dizziness, racing heart, loss of taste or smell, tender lymph nodes, and symptoms of depression and mood swing. So what you'll notice here, number one, post-exertional malaise means there's features suggestive of chronic fatigue syndrome, which we will not diagnose. Muscle pain all over suggests fibromyalgia, but again, we will not make a diagnosis. You'll also see that these symptoms group into fatigue, pain, sleep disturbance, brain fog, and unexplained symptoms. A large number will have comorbid psychiatric problems. This patient did not have any pre-existing central sensitivity syndromes. So, okay. So what does the workup look like for this patient? So the thing is that long COVID does not require an exhaustive workup. Evidence-based recommendations do not exist, but for now, I'm suggesting the approach that we take at the Complex Chronic Diseases Program, that we take an appropriate but limited workup, and using the pre-printed symptom inventory that you saw on the page before may help you decide what kind of workup you want to do. Because basically, We've got long COVID, but what's the differential diagnosis that we should consider? And are there coexisting conditions that could be hidden in that mess of symptoms? So the evaluation should include consideration of any red flags and the risk factors requiring further evaluation. So for instance, chest pain in a 50-year-old diabetic would be a very different thing than chest pain as part of these conditions. But the main idea is a limited workup. So the messaging is that long COVID, like chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, is not a diagnosis of exclusion. So in our case, the patient had breathlessness and difficulty taking a deep breath and chest tightness. But she had no cardiac risk factors, no family history of coronary artery disease, and she's a triathlete. So in her case, I'm not worried that she has heart disease. So here's a workup sheet for you long COVID, it says basically the same things that we had on the other slide. And it has suggested screening blood work that, we, that you consider. Also including anything that's age appropriate malignancy screening. Important thing is ANA is not recommended. ANA is not a screening test. So this is part of the, the toolkit that you can download. This article, Dr. Arsenault, I have a question here from Dr. Jennifer Yao. Um, yeah. She is asking, she says, many of these symptoms are also found in, in those with persistent concussions. And would you consider chronic post-concussion syndrome as a CSS? I do, but I also consider it as a trigger for chronic fatigue syndrome. Because if you have post-concussive syndrome and you have post-exertional malaise, your concussion has triggered chronic fatigue syndrome because chronic fatigue syndrome can be triggered by an infection, a psychological stressor, and a physical stressor. So I commonly see it after concussion and after um, car accident. So there's definitely overlap. Many of us do consider it one of the central sensitivity syndrome, although that's not universally accepted. 
but there's huge overlap, absolutely. So this is a quick test that you can do in your office. So if you have a pulse ox in your office, you get the patient to sit up, stand down, sit up, stand down, sit up, stand down for one minute. And if their SAT drops by 3%, it's probably worth a workup. And this has been validated. One that's unvalidated but commonly used is if the patient has a, um, a O2 monitor SAT, the little finger things at home, after 40 steps, does their pulse ox drop by 3% or more? And so this obviously assumes that the resting pulse ox is not less than 96. And I've used this in the past for patients who are convinced that they have problems with oxygen so that they can see that their oxygen is not the problem. This is part of the distortion. Their brain is perceiving a sense of breathlessness when there is no physiologic cause. So we've looked at our patient. We've, the only thing we've done is go over the patient. That sheet you could give out in the waiting room or send it to patients so that you don't have to go over it with the patient. You can just look at what was put in. And so over here, we have, does this patient fit post-COVID? Do they have comorbid psychiatric conditions? Do they have pre-existing central sensitivity syndromes? Do they have anything in the differential or coexisting conditions that should be worked up? What is my initial investigation going to be? Do they need referrals? What patient handouts can I give them? And what's my plan for the next visit? So in this patient, we would say they have post-COVID syndrome, and this will be long COVID, we'll update this, with features of ME, but no diagnosis, with features of FM, but no diagnosis, and with features of orthostatic intolerance and loss of taste and smell. They have no pre-existing central sensitivity syndromes. They do have what looks like comorbid depression. Two things that we need to look at further is possibly dyspnea and POTS, the dysautonomia, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So this investigation I'm gonna do for this patient is routine long COVID blood work. And because she's over 50 and hasn't had her FIT test, I'm gonna order a FIT test. I don't think she needs to be referred. And I'm gonna give her two handouts. I'm gonna give her the post-COVID patient resources. Okay, we'll change this. And the POTS home test sheet. Next visit, I'm gonna review your investigation. I'm gonna do the rapid exercise test for exertional desaturation. So I'm gonna do the sit stand for a minute and measure her SATs. And I'm gonna review what she brings back from her POTS home test. Here's a list of resources. So I'll give the patient this as a handout or tell them where they can find it. So for the postural home test, so POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia, that's when you go from lying to standing and you have a jump in heart rate. It can be associated with lightheadedness, dizziness, and fainting. So how does the patient test for this? So it says you can test for POTS at home. Test is as good, if not better. So, this, so the home test is actually more valid and reliable than tilt table testing. So there's no reason to send your patients for tilt table testing. So first thing in the morning, before getting out of bed, the patient will take their heart rate. They'll take it again immediately upon standing. They'll repeat their heart rate after one minute, three minutes, five minutes, and 10 minutes. Note, lie down if you're feeling faint. Bring the results to your next visit for your family doctor. So you may have POTS if your heart rate spikes to more than 120, or it increases by more than 30 beats at any point during the 10 minutes and you can stop the test. Obviously, this presumes that the patient is not volume depleted. The other thing is if you're doing this in your office, this is not associated with a significant drop in blood pressure. So bottom line, POTS home test easy, in bed, out of bed, one, three, five, 10 minutes. If your heart rate jumps above 120 or decreases, increases by more than 30 beats a minute, this is diagnostic for POTS. And then the patient can do some self-education even before they come to your office. And we'll talk a lot about POTS, that's the next session. 
Over here, salt for POTS, 90% of my patient don't need medication. They get away with just increasing the salt in their diet. So prognosis, rule of thumb. Anecdotally, most of these patients get better. Which ones have a poor prognosis? We don't know. But these are four rules that I use in my chronic fatigue syndrome clinic. And these are ones that you might want to watch for and see if they transfer to this patient population. So patients with pre-existing sensitivity syndromes, central sensitivity do worse. So if I have a patient with 10 central sensitivity syndromes and chronic fatigue syndrome, I know they're unlikely to get better. The more severe the symptoms and the greater number of symptoms, you're less likely to get better. The longer duration of symptoms, if you've had your symptoms for 10 years, you're unlikely to get better. If you have significant psychiatric comorbidities, it's likely less likely that you get better. Not evidence-based, and that's why there's question marks to see if this pans out in your practice, and hopefully we'll learn more. So this is the transparency part. We don't really know, more will be revealed. So messaging. Most patients recover spontaneously, if slowly, with holistic support, rest, symptomatic treatment, and a gradual increase in activity. Watch for post-exertional malaise, the pathognomonic path feature that will tell you that this patient is at high risk of getting worse if they do too much. This is the link to the post-COVID care. So this is post-COVID overall. And there's lots of great resources developed by Michelle and the group at St. Paul's. And so next in our primary toolkit, we're going to look at dysautonomias and POTS and take you one step further. So you know how to identify it based on symptoms. You know uh, how to test for it at home. You've already got resources for your patients and you can review the results next time they come in. Thanks for that, Rick. Um, do we have any questions from the group? I saw one on the chat earlier um, where there was a question of whether there was any research on symptoms in persons with connective tissue disorders, as many of their symptoms are due to the abnormal connective tissue versus being post-COVID. Yeah, so there is, a, there is not specifically in long COVID, there's lots of uh, pain and connective tissue type symptoms, but they're not associated with a high CRP. And so in our patient population that we see at BC Women's, uh, that's one of the screening tools because, you know, myalgias or arthralgias without an elevation in CRP that's associated with the big five groups of symptoms is unlikely to be um, a connective tissue disease. If you think that that's one of the coexisting conditions that need to be ruled out as part of your differential diagnosis, you can do a more uh, detailed workup as part two. Dr. Yao? Hi, Dr. Arsenal. Thank you for that very informative presentation. Uh, I'm a rehab physician here at GF Strong, um, and I've worked with concussion patients as well as now seeing some of the post-COVID type patients with brain fog issues. Uh, just in your comment about the post-exertional malaise part, um, and certainly I think you know, we, we're not advocating for people to exercise to the point of exhaustion, but I think there is a role for activity and gradual small packets of increasing amounts of activity. Because otherwise, if patients are chronically in bed on the sofa uh, day after day, then they really will get deconditioned uh, and it will only add to their symptomology. So what is your approach in terms of advocating for that activity progression? It depends on the degree of decreased activity tolerance. So if I have a patient that tells me that they can't brush their teeth and, um, and take a shower on the same day, to me, they qualify for what I call aggressive rest therapy. And I call that the three Ds. Delete anything you don't have to do, delay anything that doesn't have to be done today, and delegate uh, anything that somebody else can do. Uh, because we know that those patients will actually slow their recovery if they push through. So over here, not advocating doing nothing, but advocating trying to find the boundary 
of your what we call energy envelope. And then we, in, we also uh, make sure the patient understands the concept of post-exertional malaise, that it may be delayed. And if they have, um, if they have any post-exertional malaise, it means they're doing too much. And so they need to try and find that fine balance. But in my experience, I found very few patients who do too little, the vast majority do too much. Dr. Bell? Hi, um, my question is to do with antibody tests because all my patients ask about antibody tests. Are they useful, particularly for those who had COVID symptoms before uh, testing was widely available? And I'm just checking that I'm correct in my assumption that they're useless if you've had the vaccine. Yeah, so right now they're not recommended. Um, until there's a specific test that can, there's a group that's working on a T lymphocyte test that may be able to identify patients with past infection and be um, kind of like our patients with hepatitis B that we can determine the difference between past infection, immunization, active infection. But right now there's not a great way to break, to um, separate those three groups out unless somebody else has uh, information that I don't have. My patients will say, send me for the test because it only costs 75 bucks at Life Labs. <laughs> Any so what advice? I tell, what I tell them is th you know, that if it's not going to direct treatment, it's not worth doing. So, so just to give you some feedback on that. Uh, so I, I have spoken to the clinical biochemists and antibody tests are variable on the, on the age. So the older the patient, the less likely the antibodies are going to be effective uh, and available uh, in the serum. So I say the older the patient, four months. Uh, the best data that we have now, and it may be extended out, is eight to nine months. So if that, that's the best I can tell you from the clinical biochemist that I've spoken to. Thanks, Jane. Dr. Shen? And if this is the comment in the chat, I fully agree with you. Um, hi, Dr. Arsenault. I don't know if you remember me. Uh, I, was, I was your student in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, we had very slow call days. But um, my question is, as uh, our bane of our existence is filling out um, insurance forms, and a lot of problems has been, uh, in general, they ignore my diagnosis they want a specialist uh to have yeah. and has there been like any experience with respect to like if i get all the worksheets filled out um will the insurance forms be sufficient or will i have to like send every like yeah i'd rather not have to send to a specialist all the time but it it seems like more and more like insurance forms work safe bc they really ignore any expertise i have and they only will listen to a specialist. Well, hopefully that changes, but that's been my experience as well, um, especially with patients with chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia. Um, but you'll notice on our toolkit that one of the sessions is actually gonna be on return to work and how to fill out forms so that you have more success. Because I think sometimes it may, it may just be that we've done enough that we kind of know how to twist the words to convince them uh, to make it more convincing. So um, I would suggest that unless it's, unless it's um, denied, that you probably don't need to send the patient for a specialist. Are there any other questions? So one of the things um, Dr. Tracy Monk has asked us to plug as well is if you have access to Pathways, on the landing page of Pathways right up the front, there is a post-COVID um, recovery, path, post-COVID pathway. Um, and it's like all the pathways on, on Pathways, you, there's a lot of clickable links to show you where you can go and a lot of emailable patient resources. Um, so I have a question for the group. Like I said at the beginning, I'm not a family doctor, and 
I just want feedback. How feasible do you think it is to use that the first tool to give to patients either before they come or in your in your office? And if you have any tweaks or other information that you'd like to collect, uh, we can tell me now. But just also send it in to Michelle and Ravina. Um, and then the worksheet for for planning uh, the workup, the next visit, what you're considering. Laura. It's not useful to me, A, because there's nobody in my waiting room. They all come in, uh, you know, and break down the hall to an exam room. And B, if it's not electronic, it doesn't exist. I have to have it in my EMR. 95% of us use an EMR. It will be electronic. So you'll be able but to- But is it a fillable PDF is what I need? It can be. Please. Yep. And I know some EMRs allow you to make uh, any form PDF is uh, fillable as well. Uh, any other comments, suggestions? I think we're all floored by all the information and it's a lot, it was a lot to take in, but it was fantastic and it'll certainly help us, especially as we're entering yet another wave and we'll probably have more patients falling into this category. Um, Oh, wait, I have a question here from a Dr. Turan. Hi, no, I'm a registered nurse in practice. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure about that, Aaron. Um, and uh, I'm just uh, thinking that, I mean, these forms, uh, the doctor's offices that do have registered nurses in practice um, would be great for just pass it along to us and we can call the patient and do it over the phone with them or send it to them via email or whatever, you know, review it, make sure it's filled out, um, you know, fully um, and then send it along your way. Perfect. Dr. Chan. Hi, uh, thank you for the session. I missed part of it because um, I had a patient who arrived late. Anyway, um, so uh, I'm wondering, um, you know, I have patients who uh, don't live in the hot zone. They were in the interior uh, and now they present with some of these, like, I mean, you know, check mark on, on, on your worksheet, uh, but they never went for a COVID test. And, you know, I'm like, okay, well, did you ever have undiagnosed COVID? Well, we don't know. Uh, and then, so one of such patients, I, I sent him for the antibody test. Like he, he was willing to pay the 75 bucks, also came back negative. Now, my question is, um, how much do we need to uh, diagnose COVID? Like, I mean, assuming this is not, we're not dealing with April, 2020, when majority of mild patients weren't even offered a swab, but these are 2021 patients or moving forward. Uh, we know the MP swab can be false negative. Uh, do you chase them with the antibody tests? I, apologies if you already addressed it just now. No, I wouldn't chase them. What I would do is you could put uh, long COVID as your working diagnosis. But the other thing is that some patients are going to present the first time with fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome during this period. And so you may not be able to tell the difference initially, but if post COVID is your working diagnosis, the approach to, tre to treating these patients and taking care of them is exactly the same. And if over time, it looks like they're not getting better, you may eventually switch their diagnosis to chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia or other central sensitivity syndrome uh, just based on the timing. But I don't think it makes a difference. And I don't even think it makes a difference you know, whether you say they have both fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue. You're gonna, it's going to be a symptom-based approach. And that's why if you look at our toolkit, it's all going to be a symptom-based approach because right now there's no cure for these conditions. And you know, self-management helping them have a better life and a symptom-based approach is, is really kind of the standard. Last chance for questions. So once again, if there are any comments on the forms, um, please email email us and we'll so that we can take into take those into account. Um, Dr. Monk in the chat box has also provided the um, email address if you do not yet have access to Pathways, and so you can contact Pathways to, to sign up for that. Um, we are going to be sending a post-event survey by email once again, and the, the next session will be held on Tuesday, September 14, again from 12 to 1, and as Dr. Arsenault teased, we are going to be doing a deep dive into POTS and dysautonomia. So I hope to see you all there.